Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. This video is about Chapter 3, uh, which has the title Inside the Constructicon. Now, the Constructicon, you may remember, that is a model of linguistic knowledge. It's a model of what speakers know when they know a language. According to Construction Grammar, what speakers know is a whole lot of constructions, from words and uh, idioms, collocations, to um, argument structure constructions and even to very abstract phrasal patterns that allow speakers to form noun phrases, prepositional phrases, sentences, and so on and so forth. Now, the question that I will be addressing in this video is how is this knowledge internally organized? What are the links between different constructions? That's what we'll be dealing with. Okay. Uh, just to start us off, and as a quick reminder, let me give you again the definition of constructions as given by Goldberg in 2006. Um, so what she says is, any linguistic pattern is recognized as a construction as long as some aspect of its form or function is not strictly predictable from its component parts or from other constructions recognized to exist. What this part says is that, okay, everything is a construction if it is a symbolic unit that you have to learn as such, that you cannot just figure out from other stuff that you know. Um, it goes on. In addition, patterns are stored as constructions even if they are fully predictable as long as they occur with sufficient frequency. This means that even fully transparent patterns like I love you, take a seat, um, gin and tonic, those are also stored even though you don't necessarily would have to do this. Yeah, you could figure out what gin and tonic means by knowing the words gin and, and tonic. Right, so these are the constructions that we're dealing with. Now, um, constructions are those meaningful symbolic units. That's what's following from it. And uh, the view that construction grammarians advance, yeah, what they're subscribing to is that uh, every construction, every piece of linguistic knowledge that you have pairs a form with a meaning, okay? So everything is meaningful. This is, turns out, a little problematic because, um, well, meaningful units, it's, it's clear that words and idioms have meanings. If you say something like, spill the beans, yeah, that's an idiom, uh, that has a special meaning that you cannot figure out on the basis of the meanings of spill and beans. Um, last time we looked at argument structure constructions like the ditransitive construction. In there we went over some fairly good arguments that argument structure constructions also carry meaning even though they're not uh, tied to specific lexical items. So the ditransitive construction which you see as a schema here, subject, verb, object 1, object 2, carries the meaning of a transfer. Now to the critical uh, constructions. What about very general syntactic patterns such as the plan for a noun phrase, such as the sequence determiner, adjective, noun? Does that also carry meaning? Well, um, we'll have to talk about this. Do all syntactic forms carry meaning? That's the first question that we need to address in this video because as a construction grammarian you would be really obliged to say yes they do. All syntactic forms carry meaning. Everything that we know is symbolic, everything is constructions, and so there should be meanings involved. However, some cases are a bit problematic. For instance, um, if you have a sentence like John sings, yeah, that's a construction, you might say, the present tense third person singular construction um, with a subject and a verb. Does that carry meaning? Um, can't you just figure out what everything means here if you know uh, that, okay, you can combine a subject with a verb and then that means that the subject is doing the action specified by the verb. Or Bob heard a noise, yeah? Um, subject, verb, object. Is there something constructional about that? Worse still, there are some syntactic patterns um, where you can omit certain parts in coordinated sentences. For instance, one sock lay on the sofa, the other one under it. 
That's something you can say, okay? And you understand that in the second half of the sentence, the other sock lay under it. There's no mention of laying in the, in the second sentence. Um, and notice also that you can't just omit any old word in a coordinated sentence. Uh, one, lock, one sock lay on the sofa, the other one under is not English, okay? It's, um, there are rules and regularities as to what kinds of things you can omit. So it's linguistic knowledge. But is this linguistic knowledge meaningful? That is the question. Is there an association with meaning? So, um, different answers have been proposed uh, in response to this question. Do all constructions carry meaning? Um, Chuck Fillmore and his colleagues, they allow for meaningless constructions. So they would say, well, there are some constructions that are semantically empty. No meaning at all. Well. And then there are other construction grammarians. Here again is Adele Goldberg, and um, she's quite explicit on this. All constructions carry meaning, and if you can't see it, then you haven't looked hard enough. Right. Let's try and look hard. Huh? Um, Fillmore and colleagues identify different types of constructions that they view as meaningless or borderline meaningless. <clears throat> and the first of these types are formal generalizations with fully compositional meanings. That's what I've shown you with the subject predicate construction. John sings. Yeah, you combine a subject and a verb. It's fully compositional. Nothing extraordinary constructional about that, it seems. Or take the modifier head construction, where you have one element, one syntactic element that is the head that determines what kind of phrase you're dealing with, and some kind of modifier that co-occurs with it. So, red ball, yeah, or completely full. There are combinatorical principles at work here that allow you to form these phrases, and it's not at all clear that these principles have something to do with meaning beyond a very general idea of meaning. Another type of putatively meaningless constructions are formal generalizations that are associated not just with one meaning, but with a rather heterogeneous set of meanings. So there are different meanings attached to the same structure. And these meanings are difficult to bring under one umbrella. Yeah? Uh, so for instance, this uh, argument has been made about uh, subject auxiliary inversion for instance. Subject auxiliary inversion is a pattern in English that occurs across different construction types that have very different meanings. For instance, we find it in questions, yeah? Will you come to the party? The auxiliary precedes um, the subject. Had I known this, I would have stayed at home. Yeah? Verb initial conditional sentence, had I know th known this. And it also occurs in exclamatives like, am I ever hungry? Boy, am I ever hungry? I'm really hungry. Right. So, is there something meaningful about subject auxiliary inversion? Or is this just a formal resource of the grammar of English that is applied across different types of constructions that have nothing to do whatsoever uh, with meaning? That's the question. Another prominent example of formal generalizations with several different meanings are filler gap constructions. Filler gap constructions um, okay, involve a filler, that is often a um, WH kind of word, uh, and you see a gap, well that's a metaphor, um, for some object that does not appear in its canonical object position, namely next to the verb. Yeah. Um, so here we have a question, what kind of sandwich did you eat? And you notice that um, the phrase, what kind of sandwich, corresponds to the thing that would have been eaten. So we would expect uh, this phrase to occur next to eat. But as you see, eat, that's the last word there in the question. So nothing occurring in the uh, direct vicinity of eat. So there you would uh, speak of a gap, even though in construction grammar, of course, there are no traces and empty categories in this. But, well, 
the terminology. Um, okay, filler gap constructions, we also find uh, this principle at work in uh, exclamatives again. How many sandwiches he ate? Incredible. Um, relative clauses, I couldn't count all the sandwiches he ate. Um, and then the comparative correlative construction, the more sandwiches you eat, the hungrier you get. That doesn't make sense, but the example, yeah. Right, so those are another type of candidate for meaningless constructions, but there's more. Namely, the ellipsis constructions that I already hinted at. Um, so the sock example, one sock lay on the sofa, the other one under it, that is a case of gapping. Gapping, again, um, there's a gap in the second sentence. The lay verb is not explicitly mentioned. So you might say, well, th there's a little gap where the verb ought to be. Stripping is something like a more radical case of gapping. So you have more elements that are omitted from a sentence. John washed the dishes and the silverware too. So in and the silverware too, we omitted John and washing, two elements. And that there is a fun construction, a shared completion, or sometimes called right note raising. Um, the South remains distinct from and independent of the North. So what you see here is that uh, we have <clears throat> um, two adjectival uh, phrases with a prepositional phrase in them, uh, distinct from the North, independent of the North, and they have a shared completion. So the North occurs only once. That's a pattern of English. That is something that speakers know, that you can't say this. But is it associated with any meaning? That's the question. Right. Um, now, if you would like to maintain that linguistic knowledge is indeed knowledge of symbolic units and nothing else, then, well, what would you do? How would you explain away these examples? Hmm? There are two ways out, at least two of them, and I have a little quote here from Anatol Stefanovic, um, and what he says is this. He, he says this about uh, genitives, by the way, but you can apply it to all other uh, types of constructions that I mentioned here as well. So, what he says, uh, there are two ways in which this issue can be approached. First, by a prototype analysis that takes one meaning as basic and then finds a principled way of accounting for all other meanings as extensions from this basic prototype. Or, second way out, by a schematic analysis that finds an abstract characterization. Okay, so in one approach, the prototype approach, you uh, select one meaning that <clears throat> seems central, that seems basic, and then you construct extension links to all the other meanings that you find. Or, second approach, you could say, well, there's something very, very abstract, very general, that all of these constructions have in common, and I'm going to say that this is the basic schematic meaning that's associated with this construction. Well, this has not only been proposed, this has also been put into practice. Uh, <clears throat> here's an example of solution one um, proposed by Adele Goldberg concerning uh, subject auxiliary inversion, Yeah, the example that we had earlier. Uh, this pattern, subject auxiliary inversion, occurs across um, questions, exclamatives, um, verb initial conditionals, um, curses, negative inversion, and you see there are quite quite a few of constructions here on this slide. And um, Adele Goldberg proposes that, well, <clears throat> they have something in common, namely some kind of non-positive feature, something that is non-declarative, that is non-real, irrealis kind of thing, and then um, around this prototype of a non-positive, non-realist, non-assertive sentence, uh, we find these different constructions like yes-no questions, wh questions, exclamatives, counterfactuals. They all have something non-real about them, something that, okay, we're not talking about actual states of affairs. Um, 
Beyond that, of course, they have different semantic characteristics. And so the center is a prototype, and then we have extensions from that prototype. So a curse, may, may he burn in hell, is something else than um, had I known this, I would have stayed at home. That's solution one, the prototype approach. Um, here's solution two, uh, which you find um, amongst other places in the work of Ron Lanneker. Uh, Ron Lanneker has proposed analyses of this kind not only for prepositional phrases as it's shown here, so this, these diagrams are uh, about prepositional phrases and what Lanneker proposes is that a prepositional phrase like near the window or under the table or in January um, proposes that there is an atemporal relation with something that he calls a grounded thing, a concept that is um, related to the reality in which the speaker lives. Yeah. So that is a very abstract notion, but it is a notion that arguably underlies all prepositional phrases that you can find. Yeah. So there's something that all prepositional phrases have in common, namely that they are about some kind of time-stable relation. So that's the second approach, a schematic approach. Right. Um, whether or not you're really happy with these two approaches, whether you think they are uh, working, I leave that for you to ponder, really, uh, because these meaningless constructions, they are a little embarrassing for construction grammar, and um, all of the solutions that have been proposed so far, you could argue with them, I guess. Right. Now, let me say a little more about the Constructicon as a network of interlinked constructions. Your knowledge of constructions is not so much like a box of Lego blocks where everything is jumbled up um, in a chaotic fashion. Rather, it's more like, say, the Wikipedia, where you have one thing and there's links to other related things. And there are special kinds of links, and I'll talk about these links now. So, um, but just to give a bit of a backup, what's the Constructicon? The Constructicon is a large inventory of four meaning pairs that represents speakers' knowledge of language. Um, an important addendum here is that it's no chaotic bag of constructions or a Lego box of constructions, but instead this network is hierarchically structured and there are different kinds of links between constructions. And in the next couple of minutes, I will talk about the different ways in which constructions can be linked. <clears throat> An important concept in this regard is um, called inheritance. Inheritance, like uh, if you inherit a gold watch from your grandpa. Um, but here, inheritance um, describes a relation between more abstract constructions and more concrete construction. So, for instance, there are inheritance links between the idiom kick the habit, yeah, the kick the habit idiom inherits certain kinds of information from the transitive kick construction, yeah, kick something, kick the ball, <clears throat> kick the um, wall, whatever. Kick the object uh, inherit certain information from the transitive verb phrase construction, yeah, verb and an object, and then the transitive verb phrase construction inherits certain information, uh, certain pieces of information from the general verb phrase construction. So you see that concrete constructions inherit their characteristics in part from more general constructions, but of course they also specify stuff of their own. Kick the habit has a meaning that is not inherited from kick object, verb object, or verb phrase. Right. Um, did I already talk about complete inheritance and full? In I think I did. I think I did. So this uh, connects back to the issue of complete inheritance and uh, redundant representation. Complete inheritance would state that lower level constructions do not redundantly represent the information that they inherit. So kick the habit would inherit all of these in pieces of information from more general verb phrase and verb object and kick object constructions and 
not represent that information at the level of kick the habit. Whereas the full entry redundant representation approach uh, would state that low level constructions like kick the habit have rich representation that reiterate, so to speak, all the information that is um, inherited from more general constructions. So um, inheritance can be both formal and semantic. Let me talk about formal inheritance first. Um, here's a nice little construction, the preposition bear noun construction, uh, instantiated by forms such as in prison, at school, on vacation, or underwater. Now, um, there are semantic things going on here about in prison, at school, on vacation, underwater, at university, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I leave them to, for, to you to, to figure them out. Um, I want to draw your attention to one thing. Um, the preposition bear noun construction is a bit like a prepositional phrase construction. It inherits a certain piece of information from the prepositional phrase construction, namely the linear order of preposition and noun. Usually a preposition, a uh, prepositional phrase, just specifies take a preposition and then a noun phrase. Here, uh, this preposition bear noun construction is more specific than that. It says take a preposition and then a bare noun, so a noun without a uh, determiner, and um, there's a special interpretation related to this syntactic pattern. So um, the prepositional construction says give me a preposition and a nominal, and the prepositional bare noun construction inherits this linear order of preposition and nominal and just specifies that the nominal be without a determiner. <clears throat> um, the more specialized construction then inherits stuff, but it has also idiosyncratic constraints that are not inherited from the more general construction. For instance, um, in the prepositional phrase construction, the nominal can be modified by an adjective on a sunny day. That's something you can do. That's something that you cannot do in the prepositional bare noun construction. So you can't be on sunny vacation or at elite university or under cold water. Can you be under cold water? Maybe you can. So complexity, complexity. All right. Um, there's also meaning inheritance, semantic inheritance. And uh, to illustrate that, I would like you to consider the examples here on this slide. Uh, here's an example, the time he takes. That is a noun phrase, and the noun phrase has a certain meaning, uh, namely that well, it's quite extraordinary the amount of time that he takes. Yeah. So somebody makes a statement about uh, something being quite extraordinary, or the amount of plastic waste. What a shame, or what, uh, what a waste. This has been called the metonymic noun phrase construction because the noun phrase uh, time plastic waste or something, refers to an extreme point on a scale. So when the speaker says the amount of plastic waste, what they're saying is, well, uh, the amount of plastic waste is excessive. It is too much, um, more than I can stand, okay? And this meaning, uh, the metonymic NP meaning, is inherited by noun phrases in more specialized constructions. For instance, in a construction that has been called the noun phrase complement exclamative construction. Um, I can't believe the time he takes, or it's ridiculous, the amount of plastic waste. Yeah, so you have um, complement taking structures like I can't believe X, or it's ridiculous X, um, and then the noun phrase that you plug in there automatically gets this um, scalar extreme meaning. Yeah, I can't believe the time he takes. It's ridiculous the amount of plastic waste. That is what's meant by meaning inheritance, a uh, phrasal construction inheriting the meaning of a similar uh, phrasal construction. Right. Um, there are different kinds of inheritance links. Uh, so far I've been talking about inheritance as if it were just one general thing. Um, let me be a little bit more um, specific about what kinds of inheritance links there are. Um, I want to talk about four 
different kinds of links, instantiation links, polysemy links, metaphor links, and so-called subpart links. They will turn out to be very, very important for the Constructicon. Now, instance links are pretty much the, the standard idea of what you may imagine when you hear inheritance or from what I've told you so far. Instance links are, uh, in, in, in <clears throat> well, in computational linguistics and computer science, you would talk about is a relationships, yeah? An X is a Y, a, a car is a vehicle, a convertible is a car, and so on and so forth. Th those are categorical relationships, relationships between supercategories, categories, and subcategories. And this, of course, applies to a good number of constructions in the Constructicon. For instance, uh, idioms like spill the beans, face the music, or give a hoot are, um, well, don't give a hoot, really, um, are instantiating the transitive construction, and the transitive construction instantiates the verb phrase constructions. And you see how there are inheritance links from verb phrase to transitive to spill the beans and um, similar networks going on with the intransitive and the ditransitive and so on and so forth. Yeah, so those are instance links, one, category, one construction being categorized as a more general construction. On to um, semantic inheritance links. There are polysemy links. Uh, Adele Goldberg has written about polysemy links. Um, polysemy, just as a quick backup, polysemy is uh, a mapping of one form onto several conceptually related meanings. Um, paradigm case or spatial prepositions like over. Uh, <clears throat> but we also find it in more Mm, complex syntactic patterns, like for instance in the ditransitive construction. Uh, John gave Mary the book, that would be the central meaning of a transfer, but then we have also the doctor allowed me a full meal, which is sort of enabled transfer. I promise you a rose garden, a future transfer, or they denied Bob tenure, a blocked transfer. So polysemy at the level of syntactic constructions. Um, here's again a graph from Adele Goldberg's 95 work where she models this polysemy of the ditransitive in terms of a network. So the central sense is the actual transfer that branches out to intended transfer and future transfer, enabled transfer and blocked transfer. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Polysemy links are not only found with the ditransitive, but uh, we also see it in other constructions. Here's a morphosyntactic construction, the S-genitive construction. Here we might say that the prototype, the central case, is possession, maybe, John's book, the book owned by John. Um, so we have an animate possessor, an inanimate thing that is possessed, that can be I don't know, handled, it can be uh, bought and sold, it can be taken to other places. Um, and yet, the S genitive construction is also used to describe other states of affairs. For instance, John's office. Yeah, It's um, an office that John uses, uh, an office that John has a certain amount of control over, but it is not one that he actually owns. It's probably, you know, at, at his uh, work or at... Um, you know, at, at university. So you can't sell your office. <laughs> that would be funny, you know, selling your office to... Um... <laughs> oh, wait, okay. Uh, John's train is not a train that um, John actually owns. It's the one that he wants to take. And uh, John has no or, or very little control over the behavior of that train. Yeah, If the train leaves, it's, it's still John's train, but it's gone and John didn't exactly want it to leave. Um, the country's president, okay, um, well here actually we have the case that the um, the constituent with the genitive S is, well, is it animate, is it not really animate, um, the country, and the president, the thing that is possessed, you might say, well, the president is animate. Um, very different from, from John's book, if you look at it that way. Yesterday's events yeah, uh, so the events and yesterday are in some sort of relation. 
but um, clearly it's not a case of possession anymore. It's something much different. Or inflation's consequences. Yeah, I like that. Okay, um, so these are polysemy links. Ideally, you would come up with an analysis that links all of these examples together in a principled way, saying, okay, we have a central case, and then some features of the central case are mapped onto this other case, and then um, we have links branching out in all directions. Moving on to metaphor links. Metaphor links have been discussed by Adele Goldberg in connection with the caused motion construction, for instance, the caused motion construction um, instantiated by John kicked the ball over the fence, for instance. <clears throat> and, um, well, now there are examples that look suspiciously like caused motion, but they're not about motion. Um, so think about Anne tied her hair into a bun. Now that's not caused motion, that's about uh, a result of an action. Yeah, but it has the same shape. It has the same shape as the cause motion construction. And um, Goldberg explains this similarity of syntactic form with a metaphorical motivation. So you can um, conceptualize results as uh, something spatial. Yeah, that the underlying metaphor there is states are locations. So if something results in a new state, that something must have move from one location to a different location. That's the way you think about this. So this metaphor accounts for the link between the meanings of the cost motion construction and the meaning of the resultative construction. <clears throat> metaphor links are also at work, um, at least according to some theories, in the English modals. Yeah? You must be home by 10, that's so-called deontic use, uh, where a speaker, no, a speaker puts it here under a social obligation to uh, be home by 10. You must be David's brother. That's no obligation. That's something that's being said about likelihood or I'm being forced to conclude that you are David's brother. You may now kiss the bride. You now um, are allowed to kiss the bride. He may have ex escaped through the window. It's a possibility that he escaped through the window. I can't open the door. I don't have the physical strength to open the door. That can't possibly be true. Again, that's kind of a logical possibility of something being true or not. Okay, so that's the difference between sort of um, deontic or dynamic modality and what's being talked about in terms of epistemic modality. Okay, um, I want to move on to subpart links because they turn out to be really what gets the constructicon in its shape. Um, subpart links. Subpart links relate constructions with either semantic or formal overlap. So they obtain between constructions that look similar, have similar meanings, but they do not classify constructions as instances of one another. So there's no categorical uh, classifying going on. So subpart links link, for instance, um, the transitive construction, John wrote a letter, to the ditransitive construction, John wrote Mary a letter. There's overlapping material there, and there are overlapping meanings there. And these are, um, well, represented as sort of uh, links that do not go from the top to the bottom, but rather that, that link uh, constructions on the same horizontal axis, so to speak. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Subpart links trivially obtain um, between well constructions and their parts. So the verb phrase construction, as it's initiated by take the train, um, if it's a transitive verb phrase, well, there is a noun phrase in there, and a noun phrase has a nominal in there. This is, um, yeah, these are subpart links. They're probably not the most interesting ones. Um, really interesting subpart links are found in what's been talked about in terms of syntactic amalgams. Um, John invited, you'll never guess how many people to the party. Yeah, that's a sentence. It's a good sentence. It's one that we comprehend. It's one that we recognize as a con conventional piece of English grammar. Uh, but nonetheless, you notice that, well, there are different parts to the sentence. And uh, somehow it's 
it looks like a blend of different constructions. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this you'll never guess how part uh, would seem to come from a sentence such as you'll never guess how many people John invited to the party. And the rest of the sentence, John invited many people to the party, that might have come from a very straight uh, forward sentence like John invited very many people to the party. Um, yeah, so in John invited, you'll never guess how many people to the party. These two are amalgamated. They're sort of squished together and something new comes out, a constructional blend, if you like. Um, here's another example of that. And... Um, these have been discussed all over the literature and it really goes back a long way um, if you look it up, uh, syntactic amalgams. Uh, this one I found myself, so I'm quite proud of it. Uh, the Smiths felt it was an important enough song to put it on their single. Um, what's going on here? So <clears throat> you can analyze this example as being combined from two different constructional sources, namely uh, one being the attributive adjective construction. It was an important song. yeah. Uh, and then there's something that you could call the enough to infinitive construction. You're old enough to know better. He was sick enough to stay at home, uh, let alone run a marathon. Um, so if we overlay these two constructions, what we get is uh, it was uh, an important enough song to put it on their single. Yeah, so they're, in a way, overlaid and uh, identical material is kept as such and additional material is inserted as necessary. So we get the Smiths felt it was an important enough song to put it on their single. Yeah. Syntactic amalgam, um, a new construction related by subpart links. <clears throat> Syntactic amalgams have also been discussed in cases like these ones here, uh, it's unbelievable what you can do with the piano. That is one uh, construction. The things that you can do with the piano, that is the metonymic NP construction that I talked about a couple of minutes ago. And you can combine these two yeah, um, into a sentence like, it's unbelievable the things you can do with the piano. <clears throat> so you replace what you can do with the piano, uh, well, complement clause, um, <clears throat> with a simple NP, the things he can do with the piano. Um, this has been described as something, uh, as multiple inheritance. So a construction inheriting material from more than just one construction or more than just two constructions. If you look at this, uh, it's unbelievable the things he can do with the piano. That would be the box at the bottom of this slide. Yeah, it's called the nominal extraposition construction. It be something, and then the scalar metonymic NP. And this inherits information from quite a few constructions. So first of all, of course, the metonymic NP construction. Uh, then uh, there is an inheritance, a subpart inheritance link to the extraposed exclamative construction. Yeah, it is unbelievable what you can do with the piano. Um, and this construction, in turn, also inherits information from other more general construction. So, for instance, it extraposition, it be predicate, and then at that clause, it is unfortunate that you um, studied linguistics. Um, <clears throat> and also, there's a subpart link to the so-called bare complement uh, construct, uh, bare complement question. Okay, so subject complementing verb, and then a WH interrogative. I wonder what he was doing wearing only a hat. Yeah. Uh, so from all of these constructions, the parts link to uh, one another, and we end up with this blended construction, the nominal extraposition construction, multiple inheritance. We'll come back to this a couple of times uh, in the following chapters. Now, I want to finish with something normal, uh, normal syntax and construction grammar, because that is another issue, I think, that we should talk about. Um, so, you might be convinced that, okay, we need construction grammar for weird constructions, for the comparative correlative, for this nominal extraposition, for it's an important enough song to put on their 
single. But what about normal noun phrases, normal verb phrases? Yeah, here we have some noun phrases, milk, an old donkey, the big one with the two horns, all my personal belongings, my friend Amy, who recently moved to Italy. All of these are noun phrases. And uh, arguably, speakers can identify these as noun phrases. Yeah, uh, They know that these phrases behave in a certain way. You can pronominalize them. You can uh, put them into places where noun phrases usually occur. And so, um, well, speakers must have some kind of knowledge about how phrases are put together, even if uh, it's unclear whether they have any particular meanings associated with them. Um, right. If we want to say that there is a noun phrase construction in the Constructicon, does that not boil down to the same thing as saying, well, there are phrase structure rules, who you recognize phrase structure rules from uh, your linguistics intro class. Um, isn't that the same thing? Well, no, it's not the same thing. And let me tell you why it's not the same thing. A noun phrase phrase structure rule is a blueprint for putting together noun phrases. It's the thing that you need in order to make noun phrases. And uh, what you need to have in order to have a uh, noun phrase phrase structure rules are speed, uh, part of speech categories. So you need to know what a noun is, what a uh, determiner is. Um, well, if you integrate relative clauses and these kind of things, you need to know about that too. Uh, adjectives. So the noun phrase phrase structure rule presupposes parts of speech. Uh, all of this is fundamental. It comes first. This is reversed in uh, a noun phrase construction in the Constructicon. In the Constructicon, a noun phrase construction is a generalization that speakers make over very, very different nominal constructions, Yeah, over all these milk and old donkey, the big one, and so on and so forth. Um, so only if and when speakers see similarities, like, oh, you can all pronominalize them, or you can all put them um, into... Uh, <clears throat> subject complement construction, something like that. Um, only then emerges a generalization that corresponds to this noun phrase construction. Yeah? So the generalization emerges from speakers perceiving similarities across these nominal constructions. And that means that parts of speech, noun, adjective, determiner, and so on and so forth, are not basic, but rather they are the result of an abstraction process. They are something that comes at the very end not at the very beginning, or they're not something that is hardwired into your um, language faculty, if you want to assume that. Yeah? So that's the difference. Um, phrase structure rule is basic, and a noun phrase construction is some kind of cognitive luxury. It, it comes at the very end. It's something very, very abstract, and whether or not it exists, it's very much an empirical question. Um, you don't have to take this from me. I would like you to. Uh, I would like you to hear a quote from Bill Croft uh, on syntactic categories. And what he says is that no schematic syntactic category, that is noun phrases or nouns, determiners, adjectives, is ever an independent unit of grammatical representation. So it's not that these things come first. It's rather they come after. After you've engaged with lots and lots of actual. Uh, tokens of language use. So, uh, in particular, the context in which he says this is about subjects, um, subjects of transitive clauses, of intransitive clauses, and uh, what he argues is that subject is an abstraction over the agentive roles that occur in the transitive construction, the ditransitive construction, and in other clauses constructions. Uh, speakers do not necessarily perceive these as the same, or not necessarily do so at first, they may arrive at this generalization, but even if they don't, um, they would still be uh, equipped with a functioning constructicon. Okay, what kind of evidence is there? Because this seems kind of radical, right? To say that, well, adjectives and all this, that's not basic, that's derived, that's something that comes at the end of language acquisition. Um, well, one thing that I want to point out and that I will leave you with is that part of speech categories do not exhibit uniform behavior, not by any stretch of the imagination. So if you have 
a phrase structure rule, like a noun phrase that's a determiner, an adjective, and a noun that works fine for adjectives such as red, hot, big, complicated, and so on and so forth. But it does not work for a whole lot of other adjectives. So the awake child, the ready food, the on computer, or the fond of children lady. That's not English. That is word soup. And so we're left with the observation that adjective is more of a heterogeneous constructional network in itself rather than a primitive that you start out with. Okay. Um, I hope that I'll see you again for chapter four, in which we'll talk about constructional morphology.